I'm going to invite you to bow your heads. We're going to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we just sing glory and honor to your holy name. And, and we honor the name of the Lord Jesus here as well, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding on behalf of all of us. So we would ask, Lord Jesus, that this morning you would hear our prayers, that you would communicate them to the Father, and that you would grant us what we need. Because this is our heart's desire this morning, and, and the confession of our mouth is that your kingdom would come. We look forward to your work of renewal around us. We look forward to the world work of redemption within us. That you would show us what you're doing around us, that you would also cause us to submit to your will being done in us and through us. Your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. Too often, Lord, we're consumed with the anxieties of the day. Some of them are big things. Some of them are little things. At the same time, we know that you're a good father who gives good gifts to his children and that we've been given everything we need for life and for godliness in Christ Jesus. So let us trust that you will give us daily what we need. Do a work in our hearts to draw us with honesty and vulnerability into your presence. We all know we do not deserve to be there, that it is only your mercy that draws us. But as your mercy draws us, and as we recognize what justice cost you, we're overwhelmed by the grace that we would even have the possibility of forgiveness. So make us aware of our sinfulness, Lord. Remove any defensiveness from, with, from within us, and instead, instead give us the gift of honesty that allows us to experience a new life as new creations, no longer defined by our sin, and then we can no longer and will no longer define anybody else by theirs. That as you do this work of grace in our life, we would extend that to others. Whether they deserve it or not, whether they ask for it or not, would you cause us to be filled with forgiveness from you that would overflow to those who have hurt us. And that you would continue to, to work out your grace in our life, that as we submit to your direction, to your leadership, that you would lead us away from temptation, that we would discover righteousness and wisdom as followers of you, and that we would reject anything that threatens our relationship with you and with the Father, Lord Jesus. And that you, by that, you would also deliver us from evil. We would, see, we would see your power at work in our lives when we can call out the lies of Satan and his power, his power towards us, to destroy us. And even as we open up your word this morning, we do so submitting ourselves to that work, the work that you've started at the cross, that you're carrying on in our lives, you're carrying on in the church, carrying on in through history, that grace might lead to your glory. In your name we pray, amen. Kids, you can head downstairs, have a good time. We're going to be praying for you as you go down. We're going to be talking about and praying for you up here. Our ushers are going to pass around some offering baskets. <clears throat> it's a herd heading downstairs. We've been um, spending the last number of weeks in the Lord's Prayer, and by we... Uh, I was here for one of those, and so it's good to be back. I've spent some time uh, visiting our campuses, and we've been holding town halls uh, across the region. We're going to be having one this afternoon here today. Um, but it's good to be back, and it's good to be back getting into the Lord's Prayer, uh, Luke's version that we read about uh, in Luke chapter 11. And so if you want to flip there, we're not going to spend much time there today. We will be in Psalm 51 and Psalm 103, and so uh, you can go there as well. Here's what we've kind of been looking at. Uh, prayer begins by reestablishing our relationship with God, where we're reminded uh, that He's our Father and we're His children. It's then that, that we feel safe, and prayer is a place where we should feel safe. And, and, and we're safe when, when we want His name to be known, knowing that when God is glorified, I receive His goodness. And that he would begin to show His goodness by, by enacting His work, continuing His work, His kingdom work. That, that began the minute Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and will be completed, will be completed on the day of Jesus' return. And until then, God is enacting his will. And so we change our perspective when we pray. We think, we think according to God's priorities for the world and for our lives, all with a level of trust. See, sometimes we can't think macro, we can't think big because we're thinking micro. We're thinking about the minutiae. Our concern each and every day is not the kingdom coming or God's will being done. It's whether or not we're going to have enough bread. Now, we all in the West have enough bread, but I think you know what I mean, that, that the anxieties of, of our physical needs and maybe even our emotional needs 
can oftentimes drown out the work that God is doing around us. And so we just ask him, would you, would you give us our daily bread? And in so doing, in praying that prayer, we're surrendering our trust to him, that he will show us his goodness in very, very obvious ways. Then he gets into the verses that we're going to look at today where he says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. This prayer, this prayer is an invitation to transformation. It's, it's the first step towards really, really seeing the power of God at work in us so that we can see the power of God at work through us and around us when we pray, lead us not into temptation. That's where prayer becomes powerful. The whole reason we pray is because prayer changes things, right? We pray, obviously, many times that our circumstances might change or that our relationships might change. We pray those things, and many of you pray diligently and with a sense of commitment. But one of those things that needs to change is often our own hearts. And when we pray forgiveness, when we press into forgiveness, we're inviting God to change us inside so that we would then see how he's working around us. Forgiveness is the key word today. We've got a bunch of books in the, in the bookstore on prayer, and they're all being sold at cost because uh, we want, uh, want you to have some other resources as you try to figure out this mysterious thing that is prayer, Many things, a, a thing that many of us wrestle with. One of the books that's actually sold out now but was called 51 Words That Changed the World uh, by Daryl Johnson. It was given to me, and I read it over Christmas. And, and he was talking about, when he comes to this part of the prayer, talking about forgiveness, he says, forgiveness includes three different words, justice, mercy, and grace. Justice is God giving me what I deserve. Mercy is God not giving me what I deserve. And grace is God giving me what I do not deserve. Those three things overlap. They're connected. Justice and mercy. Justice and mercy can be experienced to a certain degree apart from the gospel. Grace never can. You can have justice. Someone wounds you, hurts you. Uh, The courts can give justice and in whatever way they define it. Or there can be mercy where there's there's a diminished or a minimized consequence for someone's action. Grace goes next level in that it's only through grace that the removal of an offense or a sin takes place. Justice remembers sin. Mercy remembers sin. Grace transforms by removing sin and its effects so that there can be a new way of living. Grace doesn't exist in a vacuum. It needs justice and mercy in order to exist. But it is the most powerful force in the universe because only grace can change us. I want to show you a short video, four and a half minute video, um, by a speaker who uses uh, uh, a situation that I'm sure many of you could relate to. I want to show you that video, and I hope it, hope it kind of expands on what we started talking about this morning. Why do they say that? Why do I keep saying that? 
she keeps saying, you keep saying the same thing and you've known for years that, that I don't like that, I don't want that. You should know me by now. And you're thinking, in the clarity of the guilt, at first you're defensive, but in the clarity of the guilt, you're thinking, she's right. I should know her. And that weight is there, that heaviness is there, the silence is there, and then you feel her shifting behind her. And she's turning over and you think, no, she's, she's just changing sides. Then you feel her hand on your back. Right? Or she puts her arm around you. If you're lucky, you feel her face on the back of your neck. And that warmth comes into your chest. Even there's a little shudder through your bones. She has turned to you. She has welcomed you back. She has forgiven you. She has received you. She's signaling now, I'm, I'm ready to embrace you. She has, in essence, set you free from the complaint that she has against you. Is that not a glimpse of the gospel? Like our Heavenly Father's turning to us in love, pardoning our iniquities, covering our shame, receiving us into His arms. But the effect of the process is more than simply being declared forgiven. As precious as that is, the touch, the embrace, the reception, it changes you. When my wife turns towards me in forgiveness and wipes the slate clean, as it were, I'm not just relieved that the, the burden of guilt is taken away. I want to be the kind of man who doesn't hurt her again. I don't just want my guilt gone. I want my sin gone. I want that impulse, that reaction, the harsh words, or the not listening, whatever it is, I want it out of me. Because so this will never happen again. And so when she puts her hand on my back, there is a touch of glory in that. The God of all grace has called us to his eternal glory in Christ. From the weakness of the flesh, Christ will be our glorification. From the weakness of the flesh, Christ will be our glorification. Justification then speaks to the removal of our guilt. We are declared righteous. We are counted righteous. Glorification then speaks to the removal of our sin. He doesn't stop and say, I am reckoning you sinless. He says, I'm going to make you sinless. So justification speaks to the removal of the guilt of sin. Glorification speaks to the removal of the sin itself. I'm picturing this. Jesus doesn't do things halfway. And so if you were called by his grace, you will be justified by His grace. And if you've been justified by His grace, you will be glorified by His grace. And isn't this the promise that beats all promises? Speaker uh, of that is my favorite author right now, who is also an exceptional preacher. And he's going to be with us on February 14th. His name is Jared Wilson. Uh, for our men's conference, uh, February 14th and 15th, and he's actually going to be preaching in, uh, in church on the 16th. And so um, that's what's going to happen here. He's going to drop gospel bombs all over the place, um, and I can't wait. Those of you who are perceptive heard that I said February 14th and 15th, and you think, well, that's Valentine's Day, and I just need to correct you a little bit. It's St. Valentine's Day. So it's a Catholic holiday where they celebrate love. And so if you're not Catholic, you're free that night. I and mean, you can register for the event. You can register for the event on our website. Did you hear what he said? I don't want my guilt gone. I want my sin gone. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. See, that's how powerful forgiveness is because in it we get the whole of it. Justice, mercy, and grace. So when we open up Luke chapter 11, and let's do that now, this is what we read. Father, hallowed be your name, verse 2. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Focusing on the first half of verse 4, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. There might not be a more powerful have verse in all of the Bible, but it is really easy to blow past. Here's what I do. As I've been praying this prayer and trying to make sure that it's not just a prayer that is wrote, that is ritualized in my life, that I use it as a pattern, 
in so doing that I start with praise, that I, that I move towards uh, inviting God to show me his kingdom and surrendering to his will, when I'm placing my anxieties and my worries by, by giving him the, the access to show me his provision in daily bread, I come to forgive my sins and I go, forgive my sins. And then I move on to the next one and let me forgive those who are indebted against me. I have this temptation to blow past my own forgiveness and to spend the rest of my prayer time unpacking my resentments. As I begin to think about those who have wounded me, whether that be a betrayal, whether that be gossip, whether that be projecting some sort of of mistrust on me, any number of those different types of things, I spend the rest of my prayer time rehashing my resentments. And then I just give up and walk away without praying the next verses, lead me not into temptation and deliver me from evil. What has happened? What has happened is, is I haven't tapped into the power to live my life by the grace of God in allowing me to see temptation and delivering me from satanic forces because I didn't press in on forgiving, getting forgiveness from God, of owning my sin, of being honest with God before my sin. I just kind of did this catch-all prayer, God forgive me, I'm sure there's something I've done. I'm sure there's something, I don't know exactly what it is, but that something that I've done, just forgive it, and then I'll forgive others. And it doesn't work the forgiving of others because I haven't truly experienced the grace of God in my own forgiveness. Part of me feels this shame just so on the surface that how could I go to God again and bring up the garbage again, the same thing over and over and over again, that he must be growing tired of it. What I miss, though, is the invitation of God to actually know forgiveness at all and to have not just my guilt removed but my sin removed. Because in those moments where I do get it, man, it's like the light comes on and freedom is palpable where I recognize and see that God has removed my sin and my shame and my guilt so that I no longer have to be enslaved to it. It's then that there's possibility for hope in my relationships, that there is no such thing as a dead relationship, and then there's an expectation of power that he will show me where, where temptation lies and that he will deliver me from Satan. God, in his kindness, invites us to pray this prayer so that we would receive grace that's transformative. Great example, King David. If you go to Psalm 51, I'm going to invite you to turn there. We read a prayer of confession written by David, and in the notes right at the top, it will say, it will say this, the psalm written by David a psalm written by David when Nathan the prophet, prophet came to him after he'd gone into Bathsheba. Some of you know the story, others of you don't. Let me just give you a quick version of it. David, in his middle-aged years, where he had become king and, and become bored, decides to have a little bit of fun and sees a woman, lusts after her, calls her into his bedroom, sleeps with her. She becomes impregnated. She's married to a soldier, one of his most important soldiers in his army. When he realizes that his sin will be found out by her pregnancy because the man is away, he calls him back for leave. Uriah comes back. He doesn't know why he's back. David assumes that he's just going to sleep with his wife, and this can all be behind him. Uriah doesn't do that because his heart is towards his soldiers. He doesn't understand why he's been given this gift of going home while everybody else is fighting on the battlefield. And so instead of sleeping with his wife, he stays awake at night and fasts and refuses any good uh, pleasure. David sees this as a problem, sends him back to the battlefield, puts him, orders that he be put in the front line where he is subsequently killed, murdered by David. David then marries Bathsheba, so when her pregnancy comes about, it's not so much of a surprise, and his sin is what? Covered? Yeah, maybe to a watching world, but not to God. God sends a prophet. That prophet's name was Nathan. Nathan comes to him, tells him a parable, tells him a story, a story about a rich man who had many, many lambs and had a visitor come to his home, but he didn't want to sacrifice any of his own lambs, so he went to a poor man took his one lamb and killed that lamb so that he could serve his guest. David, furious at this story, not knowing that it was a parable, becomes enraged and says, send this man to me and I will kill him. 
Nathan says, you are that man. It is then that David's sin has been laid bare. The law, the law of that day, said that if you committed two sins, there were two sins that were punishable by death. You know what they were? Adultery and murder. So he knows, he knows God has every right to kill him, totally justified in killing him. Don't know if that's the impetus. I don't think it's the impetus for his confession. I think it's just he's broken before God. That story shows us the movement of God and dare I say, the gracious movement of God to expose our sins that we might repent. And this is what he writes, David writes it as repentance. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, the in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good design in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. I want to focus on the first four verses because the latter half talks about the power of God's grace upon repentance, where there's a renewal, a restoration of a relationship, where there is worship. But it begins by him just grabbing on to honesty. See, as God moves towards us to convict us of our sin, what he hopes our response will be would be to move towards him to confess it. Guilt and shame are the triggers, the triggers by which We enter into the presence of God and offer a confession from a repentant heart that looks like David's here. I want to highlight just a few verses, a few phrases out of those verses. Verse 3, he says this, I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. David here shows us that he knows exactly what he did, that there's clarity and specificity about it. There isn't that assumption. He's not praying the prayer, I know I've done something. It's very clear what he's done, right? It's very clear he's at very least committed adultery. It could be argued that he committed rape and murder. That's a bad dude. And he knows it. He's not blaming anybody else. He's not shifting it on anybody else. He's not talking about his stress. He's not talking about the hard week that he had. He owns it. His sin is right there. He is self-aware. He sees it. He sees this sin, and he sees the destruction that it has caused. We Christians, those of us who would say that we believe in Jesus and his death on our behalf for our, that we could be forgiven, need to be self-aware. The Bible says that there's no record of wrong. We're going to unpack that idea in a moment here. But even though there's no un- record of wrong, in order to hate our sins, we need to know the pattern of our sins. Sin always begins with, with some sort of temptation, and, and that temptation is validated by a lie that Satan tells us, and the result The result is some sort of action that brings chaos into our lives, whether immediately or long-term. Take, for example, greed, the temptation to be greedy, the temptation to say, I want more. The lie that's believed when when we get greedy is that God's holding back on me, that he can't be trusted to provide me with everything I need, so I need to take care of myself. It is then that it becomes very, very easy to swipe a credit card when your appetite is triggered by something that you don't have that you want right? When I think about our town, our community, when I even think about Western Canada and Canada as a whole, 
The predominant sins of our day are greed and anger. They're greed and anger. And they're all grounded in lies. Lies that we should be able to get what we want when we want it. And when we don't get what we want by our debt, when we want it, we get angry. Whereas the truth is, is that God has given us what we need, that he secured everything in the, every blessing in the heavenly places through Christ so we can be content and therefore generous. David's sin began when he got lazy and slothful. And he just wanted to feed his boredom by fulfilling his appetite for pleasure. And what ended up happening was chaos. But more importantly than all of that, he knew it. And he owns it here. In verse 4, he says this, Against you, against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. There's the full and clean confession. He takes full responsibility. Now, his sin, his sin is before God. And what he's concerned about most and primarily is his relationship with God. Because if he can have that restored by the grace of God, then he might be able to restore the other relationships that have been affected by his sin. He's not sinning in a vacuum. He's just seeing that, that what he's done is against God first and foremost. When we sin, it's willful rebellion. When we sin, it's because we doubt what God has showed us to be true. And the first and foremost person that is affected by our sin is God, and David sees that completely. See, if he was to contrast his sin by what he did to somebody else, it would be then that he would be tempted to minimize his sin. Yeah, I sinned against Bathsheba, but she shouldn't have been out on the porch in the pool. And that is garbage. Isn't that how we've read that passage for years? Oh, David's the hero. David's the one who killed Goliath. It's not totally his fault. She was out there seducing him. No! David wouldn't say that. That just speaks to our hearts And the the exposure of our hearts to not even own our own sin. That we'll read a story like this and say, yeah, but she was at fault as well. But what David says is, I've sinned against you and you alone, God. I've seen the willful rebellion. I've seen the improper theology. I've seen why I've done it. And the truth is, God, this is totally true to my character. Verse 5, in sin did my mother conceive me. This is one of those those few passages in Scripture where a little literal, ugh, literal translation can lead us astray. Because it sounds like his mother conceived him in sin, that it was her sinful action that, that brought him about, and that's not what he's saying here. He's not blaming his mom. Again, that might be how we would read it, right? Right? That's not it at all. What he's saying is this. I've always been in the element of sin. This murder and this adultery, all of it, is true to my character. He wasn't believing the lie that he was some sort of hero. He was basically saying, I've been doing this my whole life. Christians get this. We see the connection between being mean to the fat kid when we're eight and murdering somebody when we're 48. Because it's not that far removed. That's why Jesus says, any of you who is angry at his brother, you may as well kill him. Any of you who lusts after a woman may as well commit adultery with her because those two things are not far apart. And he's saying, this is totally true to my character. One commentator said this, the crime of murder was no freak event. It was part of his character. It was the expression of the warped creature he had always been. That's harsh, but it's realistic. See, we can't be in denial about our capacity. You and I are capable of much more than we're willing to admit. And until we get a hold of this truth, this practice through repentance, we will drift into the worst version of ourselves. What had David not been doing? Walking closely with God. He had not been praying, forgive me my sins. That's why he became bored and susceptible to temptation. He wasn't praying, forgive me as I forgive others and leave me not in temptation. That's where it all fell apart. But in this moment, he had a true understanding of what was going on inside of him, that his actions were not the result of circumstances. The actions were a result of his own sinful heart. There is no defensiveness here. And so the first thing we got to stop doing if we want to press into repentance so that we can be forgiven is being defensive. Just stop being defensive. I know I say this every week, but I have to say it every week because we haven't figured it out yet. We are defensive people. There's the difference between a defensive heart and a repentant heart. Distinctions made on the back. And all of these 
are in my, on the notes that we, I've got a lot of notes, a lot of thoughts I wanted to share with you. We print off notes for you, so if you're having trouble keeping up, uh, just grab one of the sheets after the service. Here's the difference between a defensive and a repentant heart. First of all, diversion. Look what I did right. A repentant heart says, here's what I specifically did wrong. A defensive heart says this, but look at what was done to me, distraction. Whereas a repentant heart says this, here's how I contributed to the conflict, ownership. A defensive heart will downplay, it wasn't that big of a deal, admission, it was. David shows us a truly repentant heart because he's not willing to share any of the blame. He's the one who did this, him and him alone. He knew that justice would require death because of his sin. That what he had was the possibility of mercy. He wasn't yet quite understanding of grace because he didn't have Jesus on the cross yet. The consequences of David's sin was the death of his son, the child that that um, was born because of the action, who would become sick and would become di- and would die, and, and that that was the consequence of David's sin. After the, the child's death, that those who were concerned for David's mental health went to him and said, are you okay, basically? And David said, I'm totally fine. My son was taken from me, and I will never see him again, but I will one day see him again in the next life. He will not return to me, but I will go to him. In that passage, in 2 Samuel 12, after Nathan exposes his sin and, and the consequences of the sin is the death of this child, what we see is a foreshadowing of Christ. Because we would look and we would say, well, that's not really fair to an innocent child that he would have to die for David's sin. No, you're absolutely right. And God knew that, and that's why God sent his only son who was innocent of our sin, and he was put to death. The difference being between David's son and God's son is that David's son, after suffering for our sin justly so that we could receive mercy, rose from the dead in victory that we might have grace, that we might have a hope of new life. And David, I think really, I think he knew that God won't reject a broken and contrite heart. And when you put it in the scope of the gospel story that God has been working out since Adam and Eve's fall, there is grace in this. The death of God's son so that we could have life and in the resurrection we have a new relationship with God. That's why grace is so, so very, very important. Because only grace can remove our sin. Only grace can remove the penalty of it. Only grace can remove the power of it so that one day God would remove the presence of it. It's only grace that can do that. Here's the crazy thing, though. It can be experienced now. Flip over to Psalm 103. David writing again in verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repair it, repay us according to our iniquities. For high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove his transgression from us. Grace is eternal because God is eternal. Let me give you a little bit of math, all right? A little bit of math, okay? You're like, I thought I was coming to church, and you know that I'm not very good with math. What are we doing math for? Here's why we need to do math. When you look up and you see the stars, we need to consider the highest of the heavens and that God is beyond them. It would take you 3,000 years to just count the stars that exist in our galaxy, the Milky Way. But scientists tell us that there are 2 trillion galaxies in the world. Okay, The math of that if you were to add all the light years to it, is really, really big. It's really big. God's grace is as high as the heavens, and he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. Gone. It's gone. It's gone. And we read in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's gone. It's gone, and we've been set free. And yet, every day I'm meeting people who believe that God has forgiven them, but they're still feeling guilty. And they come to me and they go, Pastor, how do I forgive myself? And I want to stop it. Stop it. It's gone. 
See, here's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to keep feeling guilty your whole life. He wants you to tell you that what Christ did isn't enough, that the atonement and the suffering that he went through wasn't enough, that you must suffer more, so you need to feel guilty. You know why? Because if we feel guilty and we feel the full burden of our guilt and our shame, we will be crushed under it. And what ends up happening is we just start throwing it around to other people. See, guilt will lead to resentment. Guilt will lead to resentment. We will be crushed under the weight of our own guilt, so we just ship it off everywhere, right? And resentment will cause us to not trust people. It will breed mistrust, not against individuals, against groups of people. For example, if your father or your mother sinned against you and you let, you let resentment breed, you won't trust men or women depending on which one, your mother or your father, sinned against you. If you've been hurt by a particular person of a particular race, you will castigate the whole race for that sin and declare them untrustworthy. And you start doing that down the line, and what you have is isolation. And when you have isolation, you do not have intimacy. So what Satan wants, Satan wants is for the gospel not to take root in our heart, for us to walk around miserable and guilty all of the time because the kingdom can't grow when that's happening. See, here's the thing. Until we see that our sin is gone and our guilt is gone, it, it, only then can we begin to forgive other people. Only then can we begin to see how dare I hold this against somebody else. When I've been forgiven much, I forgive much. When I see that grace comes and fills up my heart and drives away all of the darkness, it will then overflow and I will extend it and give it to other people. And it is then that the resurrection is clear. It is then that the power of God is at work as relationships are restored, as repentance is, is welcomed and acknowledged. Does God work to build his kingdom? And then we can say, lead me not into temptation and deliver me from evil. Why? Because we've been forgiven and we've forgiven others. This is not easy, but it is so, so very, very important. It may be that God is not close to you because you've got hurt and you've got resentment. And that might be a deferral of your own guilt. And what God is saying is, let's get to the source of it. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed it. Yeah, but God. Yeah, but God. No. That idea of self-forgiveness comes right from the pit of hell. And if someone says that to you, don't say, oh, just try harder. Don't try to do, undo something that God has already done. It's like this, take this burden, we drop it to the cross, God, Jesus, I confess this sin to you, I pray that you would take it away, we're moved, we're, we look up and we're like, and, he, and we hear Jesus say, Father, forgive him, right? And that's the promise we have in Hebrews that Jesus even now is interceding on our behalf and we're like, good, thanks, and we pick it up again. That's how absurd it is. It is totally and utterly and ridiculous and absurd. So our guilt, our guilt is a trigger. Conviction is an action of God to draw us into the gospel. And isn't it wonderful that he continues to pursue us even if we don't deserve it? Our job, pray. Pray. Two prayers. I'll finish with this. Whew. Remember, it's a pattern. It's not a religious ritual. So when we say forgive us our sin, don't just do it as a catch-all. Right? Actually get into the nitty-gritty of it. I've been praying this prayer for three years as a pattern. And if I don't give myself 20 minutes left at the forgiveness piece, I'm going to run out of time. Right? I try to do 30 to 45 minutes of prayer a day. Right? And if I don't have enough time, there's no point. Here's what, here's what I do, and maybe it'll be helpful to you. The prayer of examine where in the evening or in the morning, depending on how good your memory is, you slowly recall the moment-by-moment -moment happenings of a day before or the day previous, where you go through the day from getting up in the morning and think through the decisions, the emotions, the words, and the actions, looking for sin to confess. Sins of commission is usually what God will show you, the things that you did that were willful rebellion, whether that be lie or greed or lust or whatever. 
But you'll notice that as you practice this, he'll also address sins of omission. That is, the sins of the good things that we didn't do. James 4 says, anyone who knows the good thing he ought to do and doesn't do it, for him that is sin. And so I want to look at things I've done and opportunities I've missed so that I can repent of that. I refuse, and we need to refuse, the justification and the blame and just take full responsibility for the action. There may be an asking of, why did I do that? What set me off? What triggered me? What put me on that path that morning? But I'm not going to blame it on circumstances or on people. I'm going to own all of it. Basically saying what David says, I know my sin, and I know it's mine. And then I place it on Christ. I go to the cross, and I see that his atonement, his atonement took care of it. Paul writes that his grace is sufficient. So Jesus did enough to pay the penalty of my sin, and it's then that my mind gets blown. Wow. I don't have to do anything with this? No. I don't have to beat myself up for this? No. I don't need to confess this to a priest? You did. Jesus is the priest. You did it. You did enough because he did enough. Now, the temptation there is to say, ah, that just seems so wrong. No, but it's perfectly right. And it's the way God decided it be done. And so then we refuse any further guilt. And Jesus, Jesus' death was sufficient to pay the penalty for my sin and remove my guilt. There may be a moment there where I have to go make a relationship right, right? Where I commit to that before the Lord. And if I don't do that, it'll come up the next day. But that's God in his kindness. After praying this prayer, you might see a couple things happening. First of all, an awakening to grace, a deepening love for God, and an awareness of the motivations of your own heart during the day that you live out following this prayer. You will see temptation. You will see words that could be spoken, and you will catch them. It is crazy. I hate my sin because of what it cost Christ. I want it gone, and when I receive the fullness of forgiveness, I walk in a new life and a new victory, attuned to his spirit and his direction there. The second thing that happens is that I have deeper empathy and compassion towards others because I'm identifying with everybody as a sinner, right? Which moves into the second prayer, which I like to call the prayer of the open hand, where we call out the hurt but refuse to feel the injustice. This is where we go through the second part of that prayer, for, help me to forgive others as I forgive those who are indebted to me. It's this prayer of the open hand that says, Lord, I release justice from my hand to yours because of what happened to me. A couple things we need to be aware of when we do that is that it's immediate. You don't wait. How about this? Don't wait for someone to apologize before you forgive them. Right? Don't wait for it. The goal is to be freed of resentment. It's ongoing. Here's the thing. Things that have happened to us are terrible. They're heinous. They're destructive. They're awful. They're so bad that they resulted in the death of one man. And what that means is that it's going to be an ongoing process. We're going to remember the hurt. And every time we remember the hurt, in an ongoing fashion, we forgive. Thirdly, it's wise. You see, to forgive others doesn't necessarily equate trust. Okay? When God says, forgive others, he's not asking you to trust others. That's what abusers would like you to believe. That's what Satan would like you to believe. What Satan would like you to believe is that sometime, when somebody apologizes, the sin should be removed, and you should just go back to getting hurt again if that happens. That is not true. See, what we want to do is test other people's repentance. So we're wise when in offering forgiveness, we're freeing our own hearts, but it doesn't necessarily mean there isn't a consequence to that relationship. And sometimes that relationship may be a certain level of mistrust. That's okay. We're open to the possibility of restoration on the basis of their repentance before God. Right? Before God. What abusers will do is they'll just try to remove the consequence. I said I'm sorry, now you have to forgive me. Right? 
And Jesus is like, no, that's not true. David says, against you and you only have I sinned. And until you see that from someone who is abusing you, that they are repenting before God, you can't trust them. Okay? Finally, it's silent. It doesn't tell someone they've forgiven them. You ever done this or had someone do this to you? I've had people do this to me before. Hey, I just want, to know, I just want you to know I forgave you. Right? Here's the problem with that is that's you taking justice in your own hands, right? It's not good enough that Jesus has taken the justice and given you grace in order to extend that to others. You need to know that, you need to know that they know that you forgave them. You understand what I'm saying? So we go to them and say, hey, I need you to know I forgave you so that they'll be caught off guard, right? And then we'll have that fleshly part of us go like, yeah, that's right. That's right. You're not getting away with it. Thankfully, God doesn't do that to us. So let's not do it to others. As we do that, we can claim some of the promises, some of the powerful promises, like Psalm 37. It says this, Don't fret because of evildoers. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn and your justice like the noonday. Refrain from your anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only lead to harm. Don't fret because of evildoers. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in him and he will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. How do we know that's true? Because Jesus took the penalty for our sin, died on a cross, rose again three days later, showing us his triumph over the power of it, that we might be free. Therefore, we don't fret other people. We don't live in fear of them. Instead, instead we recognize the grace of God to work in our life, forgiveness towards us so that we can forgive others. It all comes down to this, to hearing the words of Jesus as he hung on the cross say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. Time and time again, Jesus does that for us. That's the victor he won for us. That's where the power is at work around us. Forgiveness is a miracle greater than any miracle of healing, any miracle of prosperity. Forgiveness is the only miracle that can open us up to transformation by restoring us in our relationship with God and the possibility of storing our relationship to others. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we bow, we do so in humility and ask you to search our hearts and see if there be any wicked way. I ask that you would grant boldness to my friends in this room to pray that prayer with the courage that as you show it, they would repent. For those in this room who, for whom the list is long of sins committed, I would pray, Lord, that you would be kind and merciful to just allow them to experience grace of one at a time. And that you would just beat into their heads that it's gone. There's nothing to feel guilty about. For those who have a long list of sins committed against them, that you would also be kind and merciful to give them the time that they need to unpack that, but to do that with them. That you're not asking them to, to do this apart from you, but you're present in the midst as we forgive others, just as you, Lord Jesus, showed that by your example in forgiving those who crucified you and put you on the cross. As we say, Father, forgive them, might we feel a burden lifted from our hearts and might we have the hope of new life permeate our mind, our soul, and our body. And might we use our mind and our soul and our body to worship you because you are both worthy of it and kind to invite us to do that. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and sing.